if you'd yeah if you'd like to make a contribution um either indicate by ra using the raise hand function or um just um typing in chat and we should we should be able to uh, work out um everyone um for the purposes of having as much uh, discussion as possible we'll um it would be uh, best if comrades could keep their contributions to under uh, four or five minutes um as the chair, I'll use my discretion to uh, favour comrades who have uh, yet to speak or contributions that uh, draw out um, particularly useful uh, political differences. Um, so uh, I'll shut up now and uh, pass over to uh, Camilla. Um, okay, there you go. Okay, so thank you, comrade. Um, so the question today is, were early human societies egalitarian? How can we actually know about that? Um, and how far are gender perspectives addressed in these questions? And then lastly, it's really a, a question, well, does this matter to us today as activists and you know, um, fighters, class fighters, does that matter to us today? Um, so in anthropology, it's been a very long standing position that hunter gatherers, especially nomadic hunter gatherers, um, groups that consume all that they forage in the same day, who are known as immediate return hunter-gatherers, they are supposed to be notably more egalitarian than any other society that we have any evidence for. The word egalitarian is used here, I'm using that word rather than just saying gender equality, because that was the word posed by James Woodburn in a very famous article of his Egalitarian Societies, um, he is a famous anthropologist of the Hadza, where I've also done some field work, the Hadza in Tanzania. Um, and the implication is drawing the word from the roots of the French Revolution, actually, it's an, it implies assertive ideological adherence to equality. It's like an egalité in liberté, fraternité, l'égalité. Um, so people actually, in real life, they are different in terms of their age, in terms of their sex, their strengths, their capacities and abilities, but an egalitarian attitude insists on equal treatment um, in terms of sharing personal autonomy and decision making. And what, it, what we see with these egalitarian societies is an attitude that they are always working at maintaining this type of equality. They're always on the lookout for anyone who's trying to um, big themselves up and um, threatening that balance of power. And this, in the view of, say, James Woodburn, makes them actually exceptionally stable over time. Um, the anarchist Brian Morris, whose long-term fieldwork was South Indian uh, Pandaram, another example of immediate return egalitarian societies, both hissed with an emphasis on personal autonomy, that people make their own decisions and always um, keep their freedom to do so. Um, but they are also communist in terms of sharing of resources and collaborative labor. Um, so they really are a kind of tension between anarcho and communist. Now there have been challenges to the emphasis of egalitarianism amongst um, living recent and extant historic um, uh, hunter-gatherers. One is to make a sort of historical approach to hunter-gatherer populations and look at their recent contemporary interactions with farming, herding, and nowadays wage capitalist economies. And this argues we can't use current hunter-gatherers as models for human evolution because there's just too much change. There's another approach which claims a wide diversity of economy, environment, culture, technology for hunter-gatherers in different continents. Different groups can be contrasted as um, immediate return versus what's called delayed return. Um, and the latter possess technologies of storage, they can um, uh, gather surpluses, they have social stratification. Some of these societies historically have had relations of slavery, slavery and labor exploitation. Sometimes they are termed complex hunter-gatherers, um, but the idea that maintaining egalitarian relations is somehow politically more simple compared to instituting hierarchy is a very questionable one. Because after all, amongst primates, we see many examples of politically sophisticated hierarchies and alliances, but what we do not see amongst primates, especially great apes, 
is egalitarianism. That is something quite different. There's another approach which comes from evolutionary ecologists like Darwinians um, that they want to kind of, they, they really want to find out the differences. I mean, a Darwinian approach is always about competition, the infinitesimal differences that lead to some individuals becoming more fit, having more reproductive success than others. Um, they want to track down the generations. Is there difference of wealth? Well, there's very little wealth passed down in amongst immediate hunt, uh, return societies, but they look at also inherited variation of health and strength um, or variation of social connections, which might make a difference actually to what happens passed down the generation. It might make a difference to outcomes for the next generation. But despite these, you know, these Darwinians trying their hardest to, to search for sources of inequality, and it, of course it's true, some people are more healthy than others, and that might impact down the generation. But there's an ideological insistence from these hunter-gatherer groups on equality of opportunity and access to resources. And that remains very robust, even once these societies have, have long left the types of subsistence that there was their traditional format of subsistence. Um, so even after traditional lifestyles have been impacted by modernity, they retain these ideologies very strongly. But there's a more recent challenge to the narrative of hunter-gatherer ancestral egalitarianism, which has now become very trendy, which has been put out there from a surprising quarter from the anarchist anthropologist David Graeber with his colleague, the archeologist David Wengro. Um, they had an article, or they put forward a number of popular articles a couple of years ago, um, but they're also just preparing a book. And they, what it, in this book, they're attacking the myth they call uh, a Rousseauian myth that humans once enjoyed equality and freedom in hunter-gatherer bands until the invention of farming sent us right down a road to social inequality. Now, the biggest problem with the graeber wengro contribution is that they try to deal with the topic of the origins of inequality without actually addressing gender in any satisfactory way. The big risk in this gender-blind analysis whether we're talking about it as human origins or about the emergence of inequality, is that attacking hunter-gatherer egalitarianism, um, attacking yeah, hunter-gatherer egalitarianism has an effect of um, undermining our understanding of gender egalitarianism as well. It, it leaves us with a kind of default picture that um, males were dominant back in evolution, as part of evolution all the way. And in its most biologically reductive version, that's what's called patriarchy theory. It's just the idea that men always were stronger. Um, they always were more practiced with weaponry. And so they must always have dominated women. I mean, there are plenty of anthropologists, people like Richard Wrangham um, um, and, and numbers of others, Foley, G Clive Gamble, numbers of others who we just kind of take it as, as given that well, men, when were well, obviously dominant, um, there's nothing, no, no argument about it. Um, so while they were doing the important things like big game hunting and making the social connections, women stayed home with the babies. This is actually a travesty of a reality of gender relations amongst nomadic uh, um, hunter gatherers. Women actually have very powerful means to resist men's exploitation and evade their control through solidarity and collective action and social networking, which is women's real province. Amongst immediate return hunter-gatherers, no man is able to coerce a woman or a child. Just nobody can actually coerce anybody else. Okay, I'm gonna switch into some um, slides for you just to um, help guide the, uh, the, if I can do that and find, the PowerPoints, and this might help with seeing what I'm talking about. Does that look good? Is that cool? You're good. Um, now I've I've written responses to um, David uh, uh, Graeber and Wengro, um, arguing that they're not talking about human origins um, because they really give no 
um, no context of human evolution. Um, they don't even want to consider evolutionary theory. They're social and anthropologists, archaeologists who kind of dismiss evolutionary theory, which is, to my mind, not a very uh, scientific attitude. Um, they don't deal with sex or gender more than a few throwaway remarks without any kind of real consideration of what would be the, the questions or the issues. And also they're very focused on Eurasia um, and the populations of the last sort of 30,000 years in Eurasia, um, looking at the tra uh, transition upper Paleolithic to uh, later subsequent um, Mesolithic, Neolithic. Um, but they're not dealing with Africa. And these days, when it comes to human evolution and the out of Africa and, and um, the origins of our species, that, that just doesn't, it's, it's just really not possible. So um, I'm going to argue that, well, we, uh, when it comes to the focus that, that uh, Graeber and Wemgro take on origins of inequality, their, their, their first question is, where is the inequality starting from? And, and really, because they're not dealing in evolution, the emphasis, they're saying, well, hunter-gatherer societies, there are just as many unequal ones as equal ones as compared with agricultural societies. So their implication is that, well, if you go back far enough in evolution, we're not going to check this out. But if you did, there'd be just as many hierarchical hunter-gatherer societies as, as egalitarian ones. So they're just assuming that some level of hierarchy or egalitarianism just goes back in evolution. Um, so really the most interesting question actually, if you're coming from an evolutionary perspective is, is not necessarily how were we, how did we become unequal? How did we become equal in the first place is the real question. Because if you have an evolutionary perspective, great ape societies, and hominin ancestors resembling great ape societies, they weren't egalitarian. Um, we can be pretty sure about that. So let's just say a few words to discuss, to um, you know, define gender egalitarianism um, and make it, uh, clarify it. I've said egalitarianism is about assertion of egalitarian, that anybody that tries to kind of put you down or dominate you, you don't accept it. Um, you don't let anybody get aggrandized or bigger, big themselves up over you. You maintain autonomy. You're autonomous in terms of your decision making, in terms of your access to resources, in terms of just having your life support system, basically. You're eco economically independent. Um, this will be true about almost any you know, functioning hunter gatherer society that every member, even of above ages, a young child's age, five, six years can become economically independent. Um, for, from a perspective of women, uh, control over your sexual and reproductive life decisions is a key aspect of gender egalitarianism, of course. Um, and one of the, even though there are differences in women's roles and men's roles in the sexual di division of labor, and that there really are, you know, women are not involved in large game hunting, um, physically, you know, hands-on. Um, they, they may be involved in hunting, they may be involved in scavenging, but they're not hunting large game um, with, you know, um, you know, with, with weaponry, usually. But that difference does not lead to hierarchy. Uh, even though they, they may be doing different things, that doesn't mean it necessarily leads to hierarchy. There's no assumption of that. If you move into the area of, of symbolism, and of course we're very interested in symbolism, particularly symbolism around women's reproductive taboos, such as menstruation, um, this, these kinds of symbols are not uh, construed in terms of pollution, a marginalization of women that puts them down or puts them at the edge. They are usually construed in terms of a sort of power, a power that enable, that may put women in a privileged position for like moving to the other world in terms of ritual. Um, so that's another aspect of gender egalitarianism. Um, one of the key hunter-gatherer anthropologists of, of the Hadza, uh, Frank Marlowe, he's actually just died about a year ago. It's very, very sad to lose him. 
um, at a very young age. One of the last papers that I heard him give was on um, factors that are indicating when a forager society is more egalitarian. And these are the factors that he was really identifying. Um, ability to move in these nomadic societies, mobility, which means that um, if anybody is fed up with somebody else, they can kind of just get out of the way. Voting with your feet is what it's usually termed as. Um, the fact of multi-local residence, people can choose where they want to live and who they want to live with. Um, and that means women, uh, very much so. And women are usually choosing to stick with their mums, particularly when they've got childcare considerations. And they can, it may change through their life that they start off having children where their mum is, and then maybe they'll move to the camp where their, their husband is. Um, but multi-local residence means they can move and they can change and make a decision. Interestingly, Frank Marlowe identified hunting of large game, big game, as a key factor in predicting egalitarianism. Now that is going against some of the expectations of say feminists that would argue, oh, well, if men are hunting large game, surely they're getting prestige, surely they're controlling resources and women are, are therefore lacking and losing um, power. Um, but that is not what Marlowe was seeing. And, and the Hadza, his, his, the, the group that he'd done so much work with, um, are some of the last big game hunters of the Rift Valley of, of African savannah to this day, virtually. Um, he identified central place provisioning so that the game was coming back to one central area and going with that, the ability to form what he called instant fluid coalitions. And what this implies is that uh, any little sort of gang of people can gang up on anyone who's got food and do what's called demand share, that no one is going to be able to keep control, certainly not a hunter amongst the Hadza is going to be able to keep control of a, of a significant kind of food supply without others asking, demanding and getting it off them, basically. There are certain forms of food that may have some rules attached to them that we could talk about, um, but that this is part of, this is underlying this egalitarianism and equality of access to resources. Deadly weapons, interestingly, and this has been um, made a, quite a lot of by some of the male anthropologists um, and, and was originally put forward by James Woodburn, if everybody has access to deadly weapons and can use them, then everybody's kind of got to behave because if anybody becomes too obnoxious, too much of an asshole, they really can be dispatched very easily. And even though it's usually men that monopolize these weapons, um, some of the weapons like poison, arrow poison, which we now know goes back possibly 70,000 years in human evolution. Um, arrow poison, uh, just it, it only takes a scratch with these very powerful neurotoxins and that person's a goner. So even an old, you know, a child or an old woman can do, do that. Um, so it has the effect of keeping everybody kind of well behaved, that they're not going to um, go to very violent uh, arguments unless, you know, it's very, uh, it, 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 it has to be you know, so something, um, it, it's something that can be diffused. It's something that people are on their guard against. So what is our evidence on human evolution, on increasing egalitarian tendency, and why does this have to be emphatically gender egalitarian? So I'm just going to try and go the, through this um, fairly swiftly. The areas of evidence I'll focus on particularly um, is just looking at our bodies and our minds, our species biology, our life history, that is, you know, how long we live, how we quickly we grow up and, and, and so forth, and our evolved psychology. So our bodies and our minds, what, is the, what are the traces? What are the remnants? What are the clues from evolution? that actually mean we must have been fairly egalitarian. Um, and this incorporates evidence from, for instance, Sarah Hurdy's ideas on cooperative childcare as the basis for what's called intersubjectivity. Um, our eyes, perhaps the hallmark of our egalitarianism, our cooperative eyes, um, the life history developments of grandmothering and childhood, and our very large brain sizes. 
as well as sexual physiology. And I'll talk about a non-submissive psychology. Um, and then I'll bring in some ethnography of African hunter-gatherers. I'm not going to do very much today around archaeology. I've done some of that uh, before in, in these sessions. So let's just start with Sarah Hurdy's work. Um, great book, Mothers and Others, which if you want to know about human evolution, this is the best book to read uh, absolutely from this century, apart from you know, last century would be Chris Knight's Blood Relations, perhaps, but this book, Babies with, with um, Mothers and Others, it's a very straightforward theory. Um, the argument is that what differentiates us from the other great apes is um, a, a capacity of intersubjectivity. Intersubjectivity implies mutual mind reading, that we are interested in understanding what another person is thinking and then enabling that other person to share our thoughts. We are going in a two-way direction of mind reading. And we're really understanding our thoughts through what others think of ourselves, of our thoughts. Um, now, this is not something that great apes do. Great apes are super intelligent and they're known as Machiavellian. And they want to understand what other individuals are thinking. They want to predict what they're going to do, what their next move is going to be. But they are not interested in letting the other individuals read their own minds. So the mind reading is not going two ways. It only goes outwards. It doesn't come back reflected back inwards. Sarah Hurdy has a really simple idea about how does intersubjectivity actually begin. And she says it, it starts with a very simple act. It sounds like a really simple act that a mother for the first time hands over her very young baby to another individual and that you then have a triad, the mother, somebody else and her baby who's now holding her baby. And then in order to keep the contact between those three individuals, some, a new kind of pressure is coming up in, in evolution, that the mother is checking out the other carer, um, the, the mother is checking out how is the baby, the baby is checking out where is mum, the baby is checking out where is, uh, what, what is this new carer, how do they relate, and they're looking, they're all looking into each other's eyes, trying to assess their mood, trying to assess their feeling, what it, it, ha, developing interaction. It's really simple, it's really concrete, it's really practical that, that this is going to be the basis as it develops for intersubjectivity. It now becomes a strong selection pressure to let others read your under your feelings, your mood, your emotions. Um, and now the, the critical point about this is that in order for this to happen, well, who is it that mum can actually hand her baby over to in the first place is gonna be probably her own mum. So grandmother, the so-called grandmother theory is where, is where it kind of starts. Um, great, the reason that great apes, chimps, even bonobos, even those super friendly and female dominated bonobos and gorillas, none of those females will normally hand over their offspring to another, uh, to another individual. Why not? Because they do not have female relatives around them. They usually leave their home group and go into another group where there may be related males rather than related females. And they just can't trust it. They, they do not dare to let their babies go. There are interesting exceptions to that, but the exceptions almost always happen where a female does have a female relative. Okay, so if we consider African foragers, just very briefly, don't need to read all the little detail here, African hunter-gatherers um, in their marriage and residence patterns uh, show that there is a strong tendency, certainly at the beginning of a woman's reproductive career, when she's starting to have babies, her first two children, that she is going to be in a camp where her mother is. So that's uh, matrilocal fundamentally. Um, bride ser the pattern of bride service, which implies that a man uh, forages and, and brings back meat, he basically hands over that meat to the control of his, his mother-in-law. That is the grandmother of his children, the mother's mother 
of his children. Okay, and that evidence comes from Central Africa, from South Africa, Bushman peoples, and from the Hadza in, in uh, Tanzania in genetics and in longitude residence data. Um, so this is a standard pattern. Okay, this is the, the real hallmark. I've said that cooperative eyes are the real hallmark of our egalitarian origins. Um, because they, uh, we, we have um, alone amongst more than 200 primate species, we have eyes of a special shape and design. Um, and we can see that comparatively, the young, some of those young great apes, some of those aren't even adult great apes, um, with bonobos and chimps and, and gorillas there, as well as orangutans, and their eyes are very round, and there really isn't much, they're, they're kind of a, a, all basically dark. You, you might get a slightly lighter kind of reflection pattern in, in some of them, but basically they're dark, and as, a, as an ape gets older, the, the eyes go dark, and it is as if they are wearing sunglasses. It's this thing about they do not want anybody looking at them to read their, uh, read their mind. By contrast, all humans all over the planet have eyes with a pattern that is um, almond shaped. It's, it's long, it's got a white background sclera and a dark in the middle, varying colors, but basically dark iris. And what that eye design does is it allows anybody who's looking at you to see what you are looking at, to see your eye direction, what is it you're interested in, you are sharing overtly to anybody who wants to look at you what you're interested in, um, and you can look at them and see and show them with your eye direction, oh, look at that over there, isn't that interesting? Look at what, look at what uh, you know, Anne's doing, look at what Pam's doing. And, and you, you don't even have to say anything. You just catch their eye, start looking in that direction, and they're going to follow your eye direction. Um, and you're sh immediately sh doing what uh, Michael Thomas Feller calls shared attention. You see it, you're asking without even needing to verbalize that, can you see what I see? And you're, share you're meshing your emotional states and your interest and, and interest in whatever's going on around. So this is an Im immediate... Uh, uh, difference, the, the key difference in some ways between us and the other great apes, um, to cooperate in that way, to be willing to show your eyes and what you're thinking of in that way, you, you really have to infer an, egalita an increasingly egalitarian context. You cannot assume that this is happening in a, in a society with the sort of dominance relations that great ape societies have. Okay, um, so let's just discuss this in terms of what um, Andy Whiten, Andrew Whiten, called a uh, deep social mind. Um, now Andy Whiten is a primatologist with a history of understanding uh, primate cognition and the source of intelligence. Why, why did our, bra our brains get so big? Why did primate brains, great ape brains, get so big? Understanding in terms of social intelligence, um, which was also called by him Machiavellian intelligence. Um, so animals are, what is it that's the challenge for primates is, is, um, is, is working out how to uh, compete for mates and compete for resources against their conspecifics who are extremely intelligent monkeys and apes. Um, Machiavellian intelligence involves making alliances so it's a very subtle idea because you, in order to be competitive, in order to be the most intelligent, the, the animal that gets on and gets ahead, you have to make alliances. You've got to cooperate in order to compete. And you kind of got to compete in order to cooperate. It's a very dialectical idea, Machiavellian intelligence. Um, now, I said at the beginning, Darwinian anthropologists, they really, um, they are always looking for competition. And if you're always looking for competition, then to see egalitarian hunter-gatherers is a bit of a puzzle. How do you explain that? How do you get to egalitarianism if you've always got Darwinian competition? But Machiavellian intelligence in a dialectical way can get us there. And that's what Andy Whiten with his student, David Erdl, realized. Um, if you 
the more that you are um, kind of Machiavelli intelligent, the more that you are organizing, you're, you're organizing alliances to compete with others, there comes a point where it becomes impossible for any single individual to be dominant over other individuals. So the best thing to do is simple is to kind of flip that and and just refuse to be dominated by anybody else. So if somebody tries to dominate you, you can find an ally to make them back off. So what you get from Machia increasing Machiavelli intelligence, increasing evolution of Machiavelli intelligence, is what they called counter dominance. Um, it leads to counter dominance where nobody dominates anybody else. Nobody lets anyone dominate them. And Erdl, David Erdl and Andy Wyden said, well, actually, this is a good description. It pretty much describes what's going on in hunter-gatherer groups. People have this attitude, do not mess with me. Um, just, you know, have some respect, just back off. Um, and nobody can claim to have any better power. Nobody can claim to have more resources. Nobody can, can claim to have too many mates. It's, it's like everything's going to get roughly equalized. Um, so I'm showing you this, what they call the U-shaped curve, which is just going across evolutionary time, starting with great ape ancestors, there's pretty hierarchical. And they're saying, well, the more that the Machiavellian intelligence kicks in, the more that we're going to start getting counter dominance and a slide down, reducing the dominance into something much more egalitarian. Now, they don't try and give us a time period, but I'm going to try in a minute to give us a time period for this. And they say, as this comes, this kind of bottoms out, this period right at the bottom of their U is like the beginnings of the modern humans and the emergence of modern human hunter gatherers. But then what happens is it goes right bang up after that history of egalitarianism. This bit is history. This bit is when suddenly all those dominant, those, those counter dominant relations return to something like the great ape dominance pattern, although it's in within human culture and history, because now um, with the onset of farming and so forth, people have differences of access to resources. There starts to be onset of social stratification. Some people are commanding other people's labor. So that's the cause of that rapid return to hierarchy. But basically the period of the evolution of our ancestry is one of increasing egalitarianism with a maxing out at the bottom. Now, White and called White and called this complex deep social mind, by which he meant a co-evolution of three different strands going together, mind reading, and he meant inter, inter subjective two-way mind reading, egalitarianism, and cultural transmission. So if you have the egalitarianism enabling the mutual mind reading, there will also be a huge feedback process of teaching and learning. Basically, cultural transmission implies teaching and learning. And you don't get that cultural transmission without a, to a social tolerance, a basic egalitarianism. You, know, you can think about how, how difficult it is to learn anything from somebody who's kind of drumming it into you from a top-down perspective. It just doesn't work. Okay, so that's that, that was the kind of model posited by Andy Whiten. But let's now think about it in terms of the realities of human evolution. Um, sorry, that uh, going back three million years here and try and put that U-shaped curve onto a chart of brain size in human evolution. Because I'm going to argue here that brain size is one of the most um, significant features of our bodies, of our, uh, you know, what we are today, that says we must have begun becoming increasingly egalitarian. Um, so we're starting off right at the bottom three million years ago with um, basically a great ape, a chimpanzee sized brain size that goes with the Australopithecine species. It isn't an accident that all these early hominin species basically lay under a brain volume of about 600 cc. 
because that is the volume that has been calculated by um, Karen Isler and Carol Van Schaik as what they call a gray ceiling. It is basically the limit that one single mother, one single female can manage in terms of nourishing and rearing an offspring with that brain size. If she's doing everything by herself, which is what happens with great apes, with chimps, bonobos, gorillas, she's doing everything alone. She doesn't have others to help her. She cannot raise an offspring with any greater brain size than that. This is a gray ceiling. So look what happened two million years ago. We smashed through, or our ancestors smashed through, that is Homo, early Homo erectus coming in just after two million years, and we've gone past twice as much of a normal chimpanzee volume of brain size. This is extremely expensive. It's an extremely large increase of a very expensive, energy expensive organ, the brain. Um, and so Isla and Van Schaik are basically agreeing with Sarah Hurdy that the only way to get through to that large scale brain size is through what cooperative childcare. It means mothers had to have others to help them. And we can, so we can argue that Homo erectus must have been starting up with cooperative childcare coalitions, that that would imply female kin bonding amongst Homo erectus, early Homo erectus societies. And it would imply selection pressures for beginnings of intersubjectivity and of cooperative eyes going with that. So it may not have been the full whack already two million years ago, but it has to be starting with that platform of Homo erectus brain size. But then look what happens here. This is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, brains are such expensive organs, expensive for in terms of running a brain, the, maintaining the, the metabolic rate to maintain the brain. Um, growing that brain is, is energy expense is inordinate. Um, this is vanishingly rare in any evolution of any species that we have such a rate of increase. That increase is going in our own ancestry. It's going in Neanderthal ancestry. It's also very probably going in Denisovan ancestry over the past million or 600, 800,000 years, the last half million years to um, about 100,000 years ago that the brains are still increasing. Our brains have actually been shrinking lately. We're, we're more like down to this level than up there. Um, but uh, yeah, mothers had to have enormous amounts of energy there. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just lay, I'm going to suggest that if that is dominance hierarchy, like great ape dominance hierarchy is up at the top right hand corner, um, egalitarianism come down here. Basically, that level of change from being having dominance hierarchies with the great ape like lifestyles of Australopithecines, it will be in an inverse relation to the increases of brain size. M mothers cannot have been raising increasingly large brained offspring if males were in dominating relationships. Um, spending their time doing dominating and mate guarding or even threatening their offspring with infanticide, mothers would not have been raising larger and larger brained offspring. This is the era, this Homo erectus period is the era of the onset of cooperative childcare type strategies. And um, so we're, we're getting a sort of plateau of in between some sort of dominance relations might still be there but it's becoming increasing egalitarianism. And then as we hit this period, the last half million years in our evolution and also Neanderthal evolution, um, this is like, this is where that big plunge of increasing egalitarianism that Andy Whiten was showing on his chart, and it comes to a bottom out at the time period of our, of, of our modern human origins, the last 300,000 years, that is the period, that is the big period of egalitarian hunter-gatherer. Um, so I'm saying brain size is telling us we were an egalitarian species. Okay. Um, let me see how much, oh. Uh, the other feature, so what we've got to kind of ask then is how did 
where did we get this energy? How did that lid get lifted off the, the energy we required for this enormous increase of brain size? It has to have something to do with males starting to provide very reliable um, subsidy in terms of energy to uh, mothers and offspring. Um, so the feature of hunter-gatherer society is called bride service, that a male's sexual access depends on his production of food, um, basically being surrendered to the mother's mother, the mother-in-law of, of a woman. How did women do that? Well, even in our sexual physiology, we have uh, the example of egalitarianism. Again, we are supporting through women's sexual physiology is it's leveling and it's time wasting. It is not supporting dominance amongst males or dominance relations, it's supporting egalitarian relations. The fact that we conceal ovulation and that we have continuous sexual receptivity absolutely actually means that men today are pretty useless. They, they can try, but they're pretty useless at telling when is a female actually fertile, when she actually ovulating, they don't know. It scrambles information to males about moments of fertility, which means that that keeps the males hanging around. And that is just not good news for a man who's trying to dominate a number of females. He's not going to be able to hold on to a hurry, not even one or two females, not even two or three. Um, if he's having to stay with one female and then another one, he can't guard them both if another male is going to come and hang out with the other one. So this is undermining any form of dominant male monopoly. Um, there is a saying, there's a very interesting slogan, which Central African hunter-gatherers, the Bayaka, who've been researched very uh, significantly by Jerome Lewis, and it's Jerome Lewis who's given us this, this slogan from the Bayaka women who, who always have this rallying cry as part of their key ritual strategies. One woman, one penis. Now, I don't think that's necessarily meant to say I am monogamy for life. What it is saying is we are not going to be held in harems. We're not going to have two women to one penis. That's just not on. So they have this very elegant way of saying, yeah, it's one on one, you know, guys. Um, so that is just saying this is an egalitarian. Our, our sexual physiology has evolved as part of an egalitarian mating system. And one interesting aspect of the testing on Machiavellian intelligence amongst primates is that the more Machiavellian intelligent a monkey or a great ape is, the more tendency it is that, that the dominance do not monopolize all the matings. So other, because they can use um, uh, alliances, other males will have chunks of the mating as well. So basically Machiavellian intelligence spreads a kind of egalitarianism amongst the matings. Okay, we can do some more discussion of this um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the talk rather than me going strongly into uh, this very in a lot of detail, but I'm going to make the point that language itself or symbolism as a whole, but language itself really depends on egalitarian relations. Um, we, we are not going to be able to um, talk to each other if there is a kind of threat of use of brute force. We know that language breaks down as soon as violence takes over. Um, it, it, so there's some, there's some beautiful quotes. I use these quotes from David Graeber because I really like to sort of judo throw him with his own thinking. Graeber does not want to think about evolution but he has the right idea when it comes to language and when it comes to understanding what's in other people's heads. Um, this quote of Graeber, if you have the power to hit people over the head whenever you want, you don't have to trouble yourself much figuring out what they, what they think is going on and therefore you just generally speaking, you don't. Hence the surefire way to simplify social arrangements in to ignore what he calls the incredible complex play of perspectives, passions, insights, desires, and mutual understandings that human life is really made of, is he says to make a rule and threaten to attack anyone who breaks it. I don't think you'd even get to rules actually, David. Um, you would just have dominance relations. You wouldn't actually get to rules. It's might is right. Um, he has another way of putting it in his excellent book, Debt, 
he expresses it, conversation is a domain particularly disposed to communism. You've got to be on some kind of equal plane in your relationships to be able to, to listen to and talk back and respond to another person in a conversation. You need egalitarianism to do that. It is quite clear that, that language fundamentally could only evolve in a, a, a basically egalitarian matrix. Um, the fact that we're here, very large brained with cooperative eyes as language speaking, symbolic modern humans is just testament to our uh, background of increasing egalitarianism in our evolution. Okay, i am already run over three quarters now. I'll just finish with a little bit uh, more on uh, re reverse dominance. The what, what is the basis for symbolism itself, which we have talked about in other previous sessions and say a little bit with some examples of African hunter-gatherers. Um, we've talked about counter-dominance as a Darwinian model, uh, Machiavellian intelligence, flipping into counter-dominance is a good Darwinian model for explaining the evolution of egalitarianism and hunter-gatherers. But there's another model which um, goes just that further from counter-dominance to create moral community, if you like. It creates uh, a moral unity rather than just sort of one-on-one -on -one relationships. And this is Christopher Berm's idea of reverse dominance. And he notices that there are two types of primate coalition, which are alliances that may be used to maintain dominance and keep on top, or alliances that resist dominance. Um, if we have coalitions of everybody against anyone who's trying to be alpha, this is what Bohm calls reverse dominance. Um, but his model is extremely abstract. Who are these alphas? Well, he understands them as dominant males, but what he never does is bring women into the equation of, of uh, reverse dominance. And really that is what is critical for egalitarianism amongst hunter-gatherers. Um, it isn't just a matter that gender egalitarianism is an add-on to egalitarianism. Men make egalitarianism and then women get it too. It's not like that. It is women's egalitarianism as the basis to create solidarity that then can create solidarity and lack of competition amongst males as well. That is the basis for reverse dominance, essentially. And Christopher Bohm did not ever really look at gender reverse dominance strategies. But what I'm going to do here, well, I did. Uh, I was going to do some of the uh, female cosmetic coalitions, but I think many people will have heard about this before, um, the importance of menstruation because it is the signal of imminent fertility and that males are going to be extremely interested in uh, menstruation. So we have this process which we call female cosmetic coalitions. It's really the same as Chris Knight's sex strike. Um, and here we have some female cosmetic coalitions. What that is doing, this is undermining any dominant male's attempt to target an imminently fertile female. Amongst all the females who are pregnant or lactating, a female menstruating is a fertile, potentially fertile. A dominant male might try to target her, um, but by the females using this solidarity, this picket line of solidarity, they are just saying, no, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna separate us. You're, you're going to have to deal with us altogether. Now, the other males, the males who are very willing to invest, who are not trying to dominate, will be particularly interested in this strategy. They will be choosing females who show this strategy because it is a basis for moral unity and collectivity amongst the females. And therefore, it will be a basis for collect collection, collectivity and collaboration in terms of big game hunting and so on amongst the males. Um, so basically, the females and the males, the males who are not trying to be dominant, share interest in pursuing this reverse dominant strategy. OK, so we have some predictions from that, which are about um, the archaeological evidence of cosmetics in early human origins. 
about when it should happen. That is the date 600,000 to 150,000 years ago, going with our large brain sizes um, and predictions about what, what that means in terms of symbolism, um, the wrong sex, wrong species symbolism, cosmology that is lunar and menstrual. I can go into lots more detail on this. Um, I've shown you stuff about Oka in the past, so I'll, I'm going to just leave that for now. Um, examples of actual rituals run by human hunter-gatherers, women uh, as hunter-gatherers, doing these reverse dominant displays where they take over the sticks, the weaponry, they may act as if they are the hunters, and they turn the, the relationships around and show gender reverse dominance. They're pretending to be the wrong species, the wrong sex, that it's the wrong time, they're, they're bloody and menstruating. Um, the Elam bull dance, the girls of the Hadza doing Maitoko. And this is an example, the picture I began with, of the girls and the boys of the Hadza showing a real equality in their battles uh, with the, the girls whacking, chasing and whacking the boys with their big sticks, their flexible sticks. Um, and this is another superb example from uh, Jerome Lewis's ethnography of the women's militant ritual uh, known as Ngoku, which is women's fertility ritual, rituals of secrets that belong to the women. When they sweep into the camp space, they are chanting all these rude um, uh, rude chants about oh, cunts win and penises are useless, pricks are useless, um, old men have broken testicles, we don't want those old men, we want the young ones. And they are pretending to be male, they, they have for penises themselves, they play at being uh, mimicking men uh, doing trying to have sex with women and um, make as much fun of them as they can. Meanwhile, the men are kind of enjoying all this because the women are not only pretending to be male, but they're also super sexy, beautiful young girls dancing with lovely, you know, costumes and oil, oil skins. Um, so it's a very ambiguous, uh, a, a very ambiguous um, uh, uh, tone in the whole thing. Um, Again, the Elam Bull Dancer can say some more. Uh, this is just to say how old the Elam Bull Dance is because we can find it everywhere in you know, the northern, central, southern groups. It is probably the oldest uh, ritual on earth. If anyone wants to know more about it, I can tell you more. I just wanted to finish up with a beautiful recent work by Dasha Bombyakova working with Bayaka Bamajeli women in Central Africa. And she was especially, she noticed all these examples of how uh, women are using, are creating group solidarity, um, doing the ways, the techniques they use, the social techniques for egalitarianism, um, physical techniques of just being very close and intimate, sitting together, lying together, always uh, my um, work in Hadza camps was just the same, women always, sticking together, close together. They're always cooperative in terms of economic production, helping each other. They're always cooperative in terms of child caretaking. Um, all adults are, but women are especially so, to the point amongst uh, women of Central Africa that they will breastfeed each other's children very readily. They are absolutely proactive, protest, pro protecting each other against any expression of male violence. I'm not saying that men are never domestically abusive in hunter-gatherer societies, that wouldn't be true. But as soon as it's happening, women will gang together to just stop that, stop it at the root. They will use their digging sticks and other heavy implements. They will use like a big pounding, the, the um, great big wooden implements they use for pounding to whack that guy if he goes out of action. They will offer their sisters who are being attacked uh, or any woman who's being attacked refuge that she can go somewhere else immediately. It's just like the, uh, immediate. Then there's all this um, stuff about cosmetics. They use beauty treatments together. Cosmetics are not a matter of competition for women, They're a matter of solidarity for women. It's, it should only be, it can only be said again and again use of little exchanges of gifts and they may create social networks over long distances by using these kinds of gifts. 
And then there's this technique, which uh, Dasha did a lot of work with, um, what's called Muadjo. Now, Muadjo is really interesting because it's a pre-verbal technique, which means it could go right back into all the way back in human evolution to Homo erectus effectively. Um, it is to mimic anyone who's being an asshole, anyone who's being obnoxious, anyone who's trying to dominate, just subtly, quietly, somebody will start to mimic their behavior. It'll usually be an older woman. Because if a man started to do that with another man, it would create all sorts of aggression. But if an old woman starts doing that with men, other people will gather around, watch her, because usually she's an expert at this, and they'll start to laugh. And they'll just start to be this buildup of people laughing and maybe joining in by stepping in and mimicking themselves. And this is a real technique. It's the technique of reverse dominance, which Christopher Bohm was not looking for because he was looking for it amongst men. Well, men can't do this very successfully, but women are the past, you know, the prime artists at doing, the past mistresses at doing this. Children can do it too. Anybody can do it as a, as a matter of reverse dominance. And this is really the key, the sort of longest standing technique of reverse dominance. We can imagine that it would have been part of the evolution of this technique, would have been part of the evolution of intersubjectivity itself, very old. And then that last bit that Dasha has there, sound synchronism, the singing polyphony, um, but all kinds of sound synchronism of just uh, picking up each other's conversations, of responses, um, may just all kinds of even pre-verbal sound synchronism. Um, all of these are essential techniques for, for, for women hunter-gatherers, African hunter-gatherers to, um, to um, use in, in maintaining gender egalitarianism. Um, and they're rooted in African hunter-gatherer societies. Okay, we can end there because I've gone on long enough. Um, and if people wanna pick up discussion in terms of how much any of this matters for us today, um, then that's great, um, but take it in whatever direction you might like to. Thank you. Uh, okay, if we could, um, yeah, uh, I'll stop sharing the screen now. Yeah, um, okay, yeah. yeah, okay. So we're moving people over. Um, yeah, you, um, yeah, I'll just say uh, briefly, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Mothers and Others. I got my copy here, oh, it's a no, great book. It's a <laughs> um, so really important read and it's a, uh, quite easy to read uh, understand as well a lot yeah. more than capital which is uh, useful okay. sure uh, sarah hurdy great writer okay so um we're just bringing everyone in i don't think um i don't have any um anyone on the list just yet so if people be in uh, in chat or use the raise hand function uh, we just got quite a few people. questions in the chat yeah if if, if um if people, people want to terrorism first if people want to pipe up, uh, then uh, <laughs> they're more than welcome to. We've got plenty of time. Okay, I think I see some raised hands. Oh, I've just... there we go. One last one. There we go. Okay, uh, so first up, I think uh, Olaf. Olaf? Yes, hello. Uh, there you go. I am uh, using Olaf's uh, computer, but uh, ah. I had a question about a part that I didn't exactly understand. Uh, so uh, you said that, uh, you know, uh, about uh, how uh, primate brains got bigger and eventually became the brains we have now, uh, that it wouldn't have happened if uh, the uh, community weren't, wasn't an egalitarian uh, one mm -hmm. they were living in. Um, and that uh, there would be, um, um, how do you say, it, uh, the threatening with uh, infanticide and that kind of things. But uh, mm -hmm. I didn't really understand that because wouldn't, on the other hand, like something like uh, having a bigger brain actually help against avoiding something like uh, infanticide? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Shall I chip in now? You want me no, to? No, no. Can we... Uh... Take well, a few more speakers. Uh, few more. Before, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Uh, Emil, uh, you want to chip in? 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the uh, talk again. Um, quite interesting. So I had a remark and uh, a question. The remark was the point that you made about the universality of uh, the deadly weapons. Uh, that is something to think about, uh, I think, because recently we had a discussion amongst the Dutch comrades if we should have uh, should raise the political demand of a people's militia with common ownership of weaponry versus individual ownership. I at least had, uh, was defending the position uh, towards collective ownership, given the bad experiences, for example, in the US. But yeah. with these hunter-gatherer societies, they had a different dynamic going on. So that's, that's an interesting parallel uh, to make, I think. Um, and Second is a question, um, question I might have asked in the past, but I kind of forgot what the answer was. <laughs> um, so that, that's the difference between us and, for example, bonobos that also have some sort of egalitarianism going on. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so apparently not. So I was going to ask, why didn't that lead, lead uh, uh, that? for them towards a bigger brain size, et cetera. But okay, maybe they have a no egalitarianism after all. Right. Okay, is that um, any more? Okay, um, Geraldine Thorpe uh, next. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you very much, Camilla. That was fascinating. Um, my question is to do with the Neanderthals. Uh, I saw a fascinating exhibition a couple of years ago in Paris and it was on the Neanderthal people about which I knew virtually nothing. And it seemed to me they were, a, a, it was portrayed, that the message I got was that they were quite peace-loving people and they lived in communities and war didn't seem to feature, they hunted and, and gathered. So would you put them on the a fairly good spectrum of egalitarian? And when the Homo sapiens arrived, it seemed one of the the hypotheses was that um, the Neanderthals disappeared because they cooperated um, and intermarried with the Homo sapiens and uh, virtually sort of became extinct after a few thousand years. Yeah. So. Uh, just it's to do with the egalitarianism. I, I think you've got a fascinating approach. Thank you. Great. Okay. okay. Um, um, Peter, next. Peter. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Camilla. I, I too found it fascinating. But my question is this: um, if in order to counter the male domination, uh, females have to organize themselves in this way. What does this imply? Does this imply that males are naturally oppressive or does this derive from their overall greater strength? And what, what does this also imply about our current relations and future relations between, between the sexes? Will women always have to uh, organize collectively to counter male domination? Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Camilla, you want to come back on there then? Right, let me take them in, in rough order. Um, so the first comrade, um, I'd agree with the, the idea that the bigger the brain gets, the, the more ability there is to resist any dominant trying to um, monopolize, sexually harass, or potentially commit infanticide. What we could understand when we have that very sharp increase, the last period of the brain size increase, we could understand that as a kind of Machiavell intelligence arms race going on. So what, what's that? I mean, we can also see this in terms of kind of Marx's capital, actually, women are under pressure to produce these big brains um, and they, they need the help of very large brained males to do that or the support from those large brain males to do that. So they're kind of under, into a, a, a feedback loop of increasing intelligence 
to they're always kind of trying to catch up with that. Um, so yeah, I, I would understand that last period as a kind of arms race. But what transcends the arms race is a kind of synthesis transcending the arms race is the collective action that brings symbolic taboos and reverse dominance to bear instead of it, it kind of breaks out of just pure Darwinian competitive relationships. So we've got one level where there is just plenty of Darwinian competition going on and that flips into a whole new space, which is our space of symbolism and language and, and everything else. Um, so I wouldn't disagree with what was put forward there. I would, I would see that as part of the process. Um, but what, what definitely is not going to happen is that if females allow dominant males to keep harems and prevent other males from coming to support them, then those females are not going to be the ones who are the mothers of very large brained offspring. There may very well have been other hominin populations who, um, where dominant males did maintain some stranglehold. And those populations have, well, they've been lost in the, you know, to the fossil record now, but they would not be the ones that had the largest brained offspring because it would be just too expensive for females to be doing it. Um, so there would just be selection pressure against large brains. Any form of male aggression and warfare going on in our, our ancestry would have been against the prospect of increasing large brain size. The more you had warfare, and this goes to the question about Neanderthals, the more you had warfare or any kind of intergroup um, aggression, the more males' energies are going towards fighting other males instead of looking at how to hunt big game and produce game for the camp, the, the less energy there is for females and large-brained offspring. So you could just see it as the, the more energy and, and attention to, you know, the more um, investment in violence and war, the less investment in mothers and childcare. They'll just be an inverse relationship. And Neanderthals, because they became very large brained, just as large brained as us, um, I think they would have fo followed a lot of this trajectory. Um, there are very interesting and subtle differences between things happening with Neanderthals and things happening with us, but they are a sister lineage, a sister population. We did indeed inter uh, interbreed with Neanderthals. I believe we had a lot of cultural exchange with Neanderthals and we carry Neanderthal genomes as well. I believe that's probably true for Denisovans as well. These, all these very large brained hominins will have gone through similar processes and would have had similar levels of intersubjectivity, cooperative eyes and egalitarianism. Yes. Um, Emile's question about uh, weaponry is a very interesting subject to think about what are the subtle differences? We've got to remember that for hunter-gatherers, these weapons are operating, the, the men generally using the, the lethal weapons, although women and even children are quite capable to do so. Um, that is operating in an egalitarian matrix. But of course, when we look at a society like the US with its horrendous divisions of class and race, um, everybody holding weapons and, and of course with, their ge with the gender and sexism as well, um, that is liable to, uh, to lead to all kinds of disasters. We are not an egalitarian society one bit. Um, so we, it, it just fosters uh, huge violence. I would point to the extraordinary record of um, Rojava, the autonomous um, administration of Northeast Syria, where there is a very profound um, input from women as fighters for the Rojava revolution, and where both women and men are weapon, bear weapons. But what is most interesting, um, I had the luck to visit Rojava last year before the terrors of the Turkish invasion, and what is most interesting is that these, city, these armies of um, the YPJ, the YPG, the, the defenders of their societies have to go, for anyone who is police or uh, uh, 
a soldier of SDF, they must go through long courses where they're not just learning about how to use weapons, but they're learning what they call genealogy, which is a kind of science of women from women's perspective. Um, so I regard my work on human evolution as part of a contribution to genealogy. Um, genealogy means the science of women. Gene in Kurdish is, is, is women. Um, and so people who are bearing weapons have a kind of education process about how those weapons should be used, that there, there are contexts where you know, use of weapons. So it's really an education process about reverse dominance, I would put as an argument there. Um, so the context of egalitarianism reverse dominance is vital for any use of this, this uh, weaponry um, and, and ability to maintain that, that therefore becomes uh, part of the ability to maintain egalitarianism. Um, the trouble with the arguments about males are the ones dominating and who have the weaponry is that you'll never get to the egalitarianism in the first place to be able to, to get that balance um, if there is only a consideration of males involved in egalitarianism. With regard to bonobos, they are super female dominant, they, and in fact offspring dominant. Um, females, will, <clears throat> females will readily gang up to stomp on any kind of male violence, but it should be said, they're not really egalitarian. There's quite significant competition between females um, or a rank, at least rank and status that's operating between females that affects reproductive success. Um, and importantly, you know, even uh, somebody like Richard Wrangham, who knows a great deal about chimps and quite a lot about bonobos, he will admit that never mind chimps, but bonobos also have an order of magnitude, greater amount of violence in their society than any human society, any human society you want to talk about. Um, they, they, are, they have violent interactions, even though they're portrayed as this peace loving ape. Um, so we want to be uh, fairly qualified about bonobos. Why don't bonobos have large brain sizes? Well, the pressure of large brain size is about social intelligence and large group size, having large group sizes, um, they're constrained by the gray ceiling. They're constrained because female bonobos are not with their relatives and they don't hand their babies over. They do all the childcare themselves. Bonobos don't do babysitting. Um, so they're kind of constrained, which means they're constrained in how big their social networks can be uh, compared with us. Um, and the, oh, the big question Peter was asking, <laughs> um, what does this imply about, well, I would, what does this imply about male nature all the way back to Homo erectus, collective childcare coalitions are going to begin to draw males into them on increasingly egalitarian basis. So right the way back for a million more years, increasing amount of interaction of males with young offspring, males as brothers becomes a new sort of relationship with sisters that doesn't really exist in great apes. So this can give a kind of counterbalance to um, you know, males as kind of mates who might be violent or... So we actually, the domestication of males may have gone down the pathway with sisters and brothers as much as with um, mates as, as, as women and men as mates. Um, so I'm not, so this is, this argument about increasing egalitarianism is, and you know, intersubjectivity, corporate advice, that includes males too. It's the process by which we, we human species becomes this domesticated species in, effectively. Um, as to, as to today, um, this needs a, a bigger, <laughs> A, a lot more of answer. But I, I think that hunter-gatherers teach us some very important things about how women's solidarity must make a fundamental for any other form of solidarity. I mean, we, we've had some quite extraordinary examples recently, just in, in Belarus last week, um, with the, you know, the street revolutions, almost textbook revolutions of, of people on the street and then the factory workers coming out to to, to support, um, but women's activities going to the potentially very violent 
cops and soldiers to try and get them to stand down um, was uh, quite an inspiring um, picture actually and something that could teach us a great deal. Um, uh, I have no doubt that one of our great problems in creating uh, you know, a real class of revolution in, in the West, in, in our society, our incredibly inegalitarian society, is the difficulties it is to create a genuine gender solidarity that goes across race and across class. Um, it's a very difficult way. If women are divided and women are competing amongst themselves, this makes, this makes it very hard to create a genuine solidarity. But if women can work together, then that is a, a secure foundation. I, I have little doubt that women are in some sense the revolutionary sex. As a draft title of uh, the book that I'm trying to produce at the moment. Um, and so I'll come back and talk more about that uh, as much as you like. Okay, have I done enough there? Okay. Okay, um, uh, next up um, is uh, Anne. Okay, thank you, Camilla. Um, I've uh, enjoyed uh, if reminded, I suppose of things that you know you've well Anne you keep on muting and unmuting yourself maybe just the maybe just the zoom link mm. okay oh I think that no it's still doing it maybe um maybe uh come back uh try again try that yeah try a Try again in a bit. Okay, Mike. Mike McNair. Have I now? I'm now okay, I think. Oh, you're okay ah, now. Ah, and yeah. go on. Can I carry Excellent. on? Excellent. Yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm sorry. There's something really badly wrong with my laptop. Mm -hmm. um, very quickly, as I said, I very much enjoyed it and many of the themes that that you've covered in other uh, years have been brought together, you know, in this session, um, you know, taking, you know, all of the different aspects and, you know, the okra and all of those other issues. So as a useful, like, summary of your thesis, which is essentially that egalitarianism, I think, is necessary, is fundamental for human uh, development and a collective uh, solidarity lies at the core of our humanity. Mm. Um, so I think that this approach makes me uh, think about the fact that for us as communists, we need to have an approach to socialism, which is which puts our social relations at the core of our project. To me, one of the problems in in our history has been a tendency to see social questions such as women's rights. Mm. or gay rights or, 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 or other uh, liberatory questions as a consequence of um, economic development rather than something that needs to be at the core mm. because I believe that we need to take we need to involve as many people men women at the core of our project from the outset mm. because I think that that makes it a different project and I think questions even today, like childcare and women's reprodu reproductive rights, and even how we organize yep. ourselves are extremely important in developing this kind of a culture. So just one question I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, you've, you, you, you speak about the issue of, you know, when the society, uh, what we know about these, these positive examples. What about what, Len, what Engels termed as the historic defeat of the female sex? Do you have any points in relation to that in terms of how you think this happens and what lessons there are for us today in women losing their rights and in our society moving from a communist one to a class-based one? I know it's a big question, but... Um, I thought that I'd just put it out there. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry about the problems with the um, laptop. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad we got there in the end. Okay, Mike. Um, thanks for this, Camilla. Really interesting and extremely persuasive uh, argument. I'm sort of curious about what the hell Graeber and 
um, what was the other guy's name, uh, actually trying to do with this project. Mm. Um, I had then a small number of questions or issues, uh, one of which was, you said that um, in the recent past, uh, uh, human brains are getting smaller. Mm. And um, uh, then uh, I uh, quickly Googled while uh, the transition and it said the last 10,000 years human brains are getting smaller which is sort of interesting yeah. um, and, I think but why? It's a bit longer than that surprisingly but yeah um, okay. um, related to that um, okay you're describing a whole series of features which are built into a human physiology and psychology in the experience of the development of the species over the last um, 500, 400,000 years before present. But then the issue arises, uh, which is raised by several people, of is the evolutionary change uh, in the recent past, and this thing of brains getting smaller is an example of it. The other one, which is standardly put up, is lactose intolerance, which is fairly clear lactose tolerance slash lactose intolerance is something which must have developed yeah. uh, as, res in, as a result of dietary yeah. shifts in the last 10,000 years. So evolution can happen quite quickly. Um, relating to that, um, oh dear, class society and uh, there's a mildly interesting book called The Sun, S-O-N, also rises, uh, in which the guy is essentially demonstrating that contrary to the claims of um, equality of opportunity, there is just as much inheritance of class position in uh, um, capitalist society as there was in feudal society, as there was in ancient society, that uh, in that sense, the the underlying structure of it as a class society persists through these different forms. And then is the adaptations, can we expect there to be adaptations to that? Um, the one other thing, two other things, one was um, I've been reading about Greek religion and uh, you've got these rituals with iskrologia, with uh, sexual mocking, but this is in a society, and, uh, a gender inversion and so on and so forth. But this is in a society which is, well, the various different societies, but certainly Athens is uh, extremely um, gender inegalitarian. Um, how do they fit in, I guess, historical? The United States and weapons, are just a, an observation, the... Uh, um, homicide rate in England. England had uh, weapons all over the bloody place, all the way between the 1690s and 1714, and the clearing out of reduced the number of weapons in English society. But the homicide rate was one-tenth below one-tenth. Homicide rate was about where it is now throughout that period. The, um, I wonder, I, I mean, again, there's a counter dominance issue in a sense in here because the, 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 there's a background of trial by jury and an awful lot of local, um, local social control, which is by no means all local social control about the gentry controlling their lowers, their, their subordinates. Quite a lot of it is about. Um, uh, uh, the uh, middle-aged people in the village controlling the behaviour of uh, uh, other people and so on. And um, so that I wonder whether there's a connection there between the that your, your what you're discussing about. It seems to me that the what's true of the United States is that we get a very strong cult, mm -hmm. cult of individualism, cult of the outlaw at a very early stage and persisting down to the present day, the virtuous outlaw. Um, anyhow, that's that's it. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, uh, Jim Cook, you're next. Thank you. And yes, thank you. That was very interesting. And uh, you've mentioned on and on, I think, the, you know, the relevance to today. I, one relevant thing, I think, is if we're arguing with the ignorant or 
shall I just say they're even more ignorant, uh, there's this idea that capitalism uh, and hierarchy, of course, as, uh, as well, are immortal. They've always been there. They always will be there and so on. Uh, there's <laughs> no way that we're going to remember everything you said, but I think it's, it's worth educating us and we're educating yeah. ourselves. Uh, some of the background as to how untrue this is. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, what where we are now and where assertion is now for, for social grouping. Uh, I was thinking like, you know, if you're in the pub with some people, with your friends, with some acquaintances, uh, a few strangers and all the rest of it, mm-hmm. even before you start drinking, assertion isn't really, and hierarchy don't really come into, the, in, into it, unless you're with your boss or something like that, maybe. Right. But... Um, and the same at work, especially manual work. And I found, you know, building work, uh, post office, that sort of factory work. Um, yep. The people you're working with, yes. you, you don't expect them to uh, push their, their luck sort of thing. Uh, your work companions and you will, will, will push back. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a couple of rules I thought of when I used to do manual work. One is uh, don't take the piss, i.e. Uh, letting other people carry do all your work for you. Yeah. And don't don't grasp your work colleagues. You may not defend them, but if, yeah. if they are uh, taking the piss, but you don't you don't grasp them up. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, women can be assertive as well. I think in okay. work. Uh, especially in office work that I've also done, yep. um, you've you've got bosses. <laughs> uh, you've you've got uh, bosses, <laughs> <laughs> more experienced colleagues, and so on. But another thing I thought, given, given my age, is that tends to drop away when you retire, mm. and you can meet these same people when you're both retired. And who's the boss? <laughs> Nobody. Mm. Uh, you can have a perfectly friendly chat, assuming that everybody's a decent human being. Um, but of course, we have to accept, you know, the political history of, of uh, religious hierarchy, political hierarchy, uh, and mostly, of course, that hierarchy, which is uh, enforced through extreme violence, which is a, a large part of uh, the last few thousand years. Um, but another thing of women working together made me think of, uh, you know, the late 60s, uh, women expected to make the coffee while the men were organising the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations and so on. And, of course, women got together then and said, no, yeah. we're not going to do it. Yeah. And, in fact, men, uh, it wasn't a matter of, in many cases, it wasn't a matter of men backing down. It was... Oh, I never thought of that, <laughs> that, you, that we were being so oppressive or, or coercive or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, it could be quite a simple uh, transition, really, from, you know, we are all human beings. Mm. Well, well, some people have got other interests, of course, outside that. Thank you. Okay, I just want to uh, bring in um, uh, Gabby and Phil. Are we going to be able to make all these? <laughs> I, we should, hopefully. Oh, um, okay, it's quite a lot yep. to bite. Okay, Gavin. Uh, do you do you want to answer a few and then I'll come back if there's time? That's okay. Uh, maybe, maybe another one. Go go for it. Go for it. Okay. I, I'm a little bit less uh, sanguine than the previous speaker about male and female relationships. Um, I've been in the communist movement a very long time, and I remember in the beginning, before the women's liberation movement came and men became sort of afraid to say this, I was always being told that uh, the women question will be solved when the working class is dominant. And then, and and it was also a case that the black question will also be solved when the working class was dominant. That changed, uh, at least in terms of nomenclature that's used. I'm not so sure it's changed totally 
in the way that men, political men I'm talking about specifically actually relate to women, but that's another story. My question for you is, do you think that the kind of women's solidarity that you see throughout this talk, you know, the, the different kinds of mm -hmm. solidarity that, that women have with each other mm -hmm. is still um, necessary for women in political organizations to counter male political dominance. Because in my view, in a lot of the left groups, male political dominance is rampant and it includes uh, talking over women, being uh, condescending to women, um, <laughs> not being particularly helpful in terms of bringing women on when they come into groups, um, et cetera. Mm. So um, that's my question. And I, I'm not going to apologize for asking it either. I shouldn't. <laughs> it's key. <laughs> um, shall, shall we go with that? Chair? Yep. Yeah. Um, in a word, of course, Gabby, yes, <laughs> necessarily so. And the, that uh, women ha should have, you know, women's um, only fora for organization and, and space for organize and time for their organization to maintain the strategies to keep men in their place. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I have no doubt about that. Um, going along with, uh, I mean, there, there would be a whole aspect of the discussion to open up about uh, about trans and so forth, but, but uh, let's just stay with that for the moment. Um, yeah, I, I, I could carry on talking about that all night. Um, should, um, come up with more questions, anybody wants to. Um, shall I, and Anne has asked about the, the world historic defeat and what, and what that entails. We are seeing these very egalitarian societies with women need each other. They need each other so much because, because that's the way they stop being exploited. They can stop any man telling them what to do. Um, they just, they create with so creative cultural means their solidarity. Um, when the economies of great ga big game hunting broke down, women were in increasingly in less able to maintain solidarity links. Also, if uh, societies go into settlement and become increasingly population dense, and this goes to some of the arguments of Graeber and Wengro actually, if, if women can't move around readily, if they can't go back to their relatives and, their, and find other places to go, Mobility is a key factor for women. If you just think about that in terms of domestic violence, what we've seen in the lockdown, that if women are stuck in one space with a man that's abusive and they have nowhere to go, that is a disaster. If women have places to go. So again, I'd address my, my experience in Rojava, that the major, this is an enormous experiment of, in Northern Syria of women's rights in an incredibly patriarchal area where um, women's refuges have become established like women's houses on every street corner. And if anybody starts beating up on a woman, a woman can just go to, to a wage to find her sisters. So it's just creating, it's just building into life places for women to go to find support and ensuring they can find support. Um, that there are all kinds of ways that it, it might be done, but this is very basic stuff. And so the more that women get atomized, the more that women especially got privatized in like monogamous marriage. I mean, Engels had that pretty right, I would say. The more that uh, one man has uh, kind of the rights, sexual rights on a woman, that that woman is separated from her kin and from her mother, especially mother in, the mother-in-law of the man. Um, these, are the, these are ways that women started to lose their power. Um, but but this becomes symbolized and symbolis, symbolic and ritual emphasis on male power in the place of women's power. The interesting thing about that was, as, as Chris has shown us with Aboriginal Australia, Aboriginal Australia is like a, a sort of key example of original gender in egalitarianism because they, they still seem to have immediate return societies 
but what they have lost is large game, the, the, the large game's gone. And so men are scratching around for small game in very, uh, very resource stressed circumstances. What happens is that actually women end up doing as much, they end up feeding men. So they're not just having these very large babies, but women are also feeding the men. And then it becomes perfectly in the interests of males if they can dominate, if they can maintain a, a string of wives, well, those wives are going to be working for them. Those wives are like they're a prime labor force. Um, and also men may be um, you know, manipulating <coughs> the daughters of, of the wives to um, hand them out to men that they want to work for them. You know, so so you, get, you start to get these hierarchical structures building really quickly. Um, and it kind of goes through ritual, which is why it's quite interesting to hear Mike talking about the Greek religious ritual. I, I know quite a bit about um, some of that Greek religious ritual. The, the symbolism, the, the um, design of ritual, like what is it that creates ritual power has an extraordinary conservancy, which Chris and myself and Ian and others who worked on this have called time resistant syntax. So this thing of blood flow and of a gender inversion of a wrong sex, wrong species is very typical um, the, the, the sort of the design of what, what ritual power looks like. Now, when men appropriate and take over that power, they're very often doing things that mimic female reproduction, pregnancy or menstruation in various ways. But they may, if they're, if they're pretending to be female effectively, they may put, um, uh, make this very secret. So we see that in, for instance, Aboriginal ritual. Um, but what we get also is a pattern whereby, um, for instance, in the Greek patriarchy, um, women are kept very much indoors, in the house, um, uh, in property of men, private property of men, perhaps slaves of men and so forth. Um, but women's participation in ritual may still be absolutely vital for creating the cosmology. And therefore they kind of have, they're devoid of political power, but like in Greek ritual, Thesmophoria Zeusa, the, the most vital ritual of, of kind of Greek culture was effectively a female kinship coalition ritual action that took over the center of the Greek polis for a few days. And, and it was, um, you know, absolutely a, a women's um, dominated thing, uh, which is celebrated in, in many of the, the comic plays of Aristophanes, for instance. Um, just to talk to the brains, uh, the brain sizes, it actually seems to have been happening over about 20, 25,000 years since the big cold that our brain sizes have gone down. And I think there would be a case to make that some levels of, uh, of inegalitarianism may have been creeping in alongside that. Um, it is certainly suggestive that the brain size decrease runs alongside the onset of agriculture and therefore possibly less dietary input. Because of course with agriculture, um, women will be doing more of the work again, just like the Aboriginal women in their foraging groups would be doing more of the work. Women will be doing more of the work in, in, agri in early agriculture also comparatively. And this may have depressed um, the, 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 their capacity for giving birth to very large brained offspring. Um, in terms of our current of recent evolution, I'm sure there is a significant amount. You've mentioned lactose intolerance. Um, there would be things like malaria, immunity and the sickle cell and so forth that would be examples of recent human evolution. Um, but one thing that's really interesting is the question that the genetics has been able to show that um, there was a collapse of diversity of Y chromosome lineages that comes in with the early Neolithic about six to 8,000 years ago. Basically it's coinciding with uh, the Indo-European migration, early Indo-European migrations, farming, horse wheel cultures. That, that implies, what that's saying is that suddenly harems were back big time 
um, that whereas previously with hunter-gatherers, you get a very wide diversity of uh, Y chromosomes. Hadza hunter-gatherers have incredible diversity of Y chromosomes. Why? Because nearly every man gets sexual chances. But that is not the case in farming societies with slavery and stratification. Some men hold lots of wives or concubines. Other men have no access to women and may become slaves or, or, or laborers themselves. Um, so that, that is a very significant sort of aspect of genetic data that is really tracing the history of the loss of egalitarianism in terms of the, where it counts most, evolutionary egalitarianism. So that's really significant. Herdy, Sarah Hurdy has expressed her anxieties over the possibility that with um, an internet, with uh, our, you know, with children spending more and more of their time kind of interfacing through computers rather than one-to-one, -one, face to face, that you may there may even be a process of evolution towards loss of empathy, that we'd actually start to sort of reverse the, the evolution of corporate divides, potentially. But I think these things will take an awful long time, and that our human nature will resist those that that uh, as well. We're resistors as much as we are acceptors. So when you know, when when Jim is talking about his mates down the pub, um, you know, the idea, capitalism is a few generations old. If capitalism goes back 10 feet, I mean, it depends where you are in the world where capitalist relations go back, but 10, 15 generations to early industrial revolution. All right, inequality is going back a lot further than that, a few thousand years. But our species history is 200, 300,000 years old. The generations that we have spent with these large brains, with these non-submissive psychologies, with our cooperative eyes, uh, that is what's made us, you know, our bodies and minds, our hearts, our souls, we're still hunter-gatherers, we're not. Which means that inegalitarianism makes us ill. It makes us just unhealthy. We can't cope with it very well. And that means that in all our daily lives, we find ways and means of creating egalitarian bubbles in which we can live comfortably. We do that in all kinds of ways with our friends, with our mates in the pub, with our, Jim's absolutely right. We don't have hierarchies in those contexts. We just don't. We'll make, we'll use muadjo. We'll use laughing and joking to level people down from any attempt to be assertive or dominant. Um, and that's our, so it's not just take, not take the piss in, in the sense that Jim said, but in take the piss in, in the egalitarian sense of if anybody gets too big for their boots, peg, peg them back really bring them back. Um, uh, have I covered most, I think I've got, got around most of that, maybe not answered enough on some of those big questions. Thank you for the questions, very good. Okay, uh, we still got uh, a good uh, 45 minutes. I will leave you some yeah. time to uh, sum up. Um, I uh, really need to hook up my computer in case it all runs down. But anyway, I'll just move and do that. Chris has got a, a lead upstairs. So I'll do that. Okay, um, right. Um, in that case, uh, Jack Conrad. Thanks very much, uh, Camilla. Um, I was just thinking on this brain thing. Uh, you've answered um, a lot of it. Um, as I understand it, if you look at the, the bone structure of the earliest agriculturalists, there's all sorts of rickets. There's a, a shrinkage. Because I was also going to add in, because we always think, you know, agriculture, great stuff. Uh, but on the other hand, you look at hunter gatherers, you know, um, I read that book, I can't remember her name, but the one, the cave bear books, you know, the novels. Oh, yeah, Jean Arles. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, she describes their hunter gatherers not only eating bison or whatever, but hundreds and hundreds of different oh, yeah. plants. Oh, yeah. Where where we have been, certainly our ancestors and we until recent times and still now, we're very much reduced to a mono diet. And if, if you think about it, um, over recent years in the social democracies, the welfare state, the height has actually got bigger. Yeah. So, you know, you look at South Wales miners and the was it the Bantam 
um, regiments or units in the British Army World War I. This shows you a degradation, a physical degradation of the working class, the peasant class, but also our ancestors going back to the origins of agriculture. But also you spoke about uh, the breakdown um, of original communism. And in that sense, yes, Australia has um, wallabies or whatever the hell they have, kangaroos. Wallabies if you look at- Kangaroos would be good. It's yeah, of course. <laughs> but what I was gonna say is if you look at what we found, we, um, in terms of when human beings first went there, uh, yeah. there's been a massive destruction. Anyway, uh, that was just uh, a point on that. Um, I was also going to say, just on the, the women have a place to go theme, that if you look at Henry Morgan and uh, Engels, what he quotes is a man's got somewhere to go. Yeah. And I think that I was just going to put that one in. Yep. in the sense that uh, Henry Morgan describes a man and a woman falling out yeah, and yeah. everyone gangs up to kick him out. He goes, um, you know, so I'm sort of backing up what you're saying, but making the point precisely as you were saying, that in general men moved in, yeah. moved in to where his wife had brothers and she was the strong one in terms of social connection so obviously i i support women's refugees refuges really? but it'd be surely a good idea for men to have refugees as opposed to women sure. i here's an incentive well, pubs, aren't they but yeah i know but here's an incentive for you not falling out because if you fall out with your your missus you get kicked out you get turfed out you're the one that's humiliated anyway that's just a sort of couple of points my last point actually is about david uh, graber um, I enjoyed his book on debt. I thought it was a bit over, mm. overdone. I everything becomes about debt, but also what I thought about it, and I think it's pretty obvious, uh, is what he's doing is deliberately, consciously attacking Marxism. And so yes. what he's what he's trying to do uh, with debt is attack Marx's theory of money, mm. and replacing it with the state theory. Of yeah. money. I don't think that's in contradict. I don't think Marx would say, oh, that's impossible. And if you raise the role of the state, but I think that's what he was doing. And I think in this stuff, yeah, I, when I first heard this, you know, from Chris talking about uh, David, I went, what's motivating him here? And I don't think it's anthropology. I don't think it's archaeology. Uh, I think it's his project to intellectually undermine and, and replace Marxism. Mm -hmm. And precisely, if he only goes back 30,000 years, mm. if he concentrates on Euro-Asia, he's missing the big history. Yeah. Uh, and in that sense, it reminds me, and this is the last point, Stephen Pinker, mm. uh, the angels of men or whatever. Yeah. No, exactly. 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 Here he is. He says uh, war violence has been decreasing over this period. So he begins in the Neolithic. Yeah. And he says, well, I'm going to ignore you know, not only nine, well, I'm going to use a phrase, nine tenths of our history, that's being a bit, you know, but nine tenths of the history gets excluded mm -hmm. because he, he wants to show that violence has uh, actually decreased. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, how, how about the other 90,000 years, or as you were saying, 190,000 mm -hmm. other years? Yeah. In other words, the Neolithic actually represents that which we might then have declined from using jiggery pokery statistics. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, it's selective, isn't it? it it's mm -hmm. not taking things in the round. And that's what we should surely be striving to do if we're going to arrive at a genuine understanding. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. OK, um, so um, there's an interesting question in the chat here. I just uh, asked if I could read out. Um, OK, it's from uh, Yara. Um, given that your analysis included intergender dynamics and relations, what do you think of the idea asserted the, uh, these days that a future uh, of uh, equality will be a genderless society and a gender society? Um, okay, yeah, it's so that. Big, big, big question, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so I don't actually have any more uh, anyone else indicating. I'll just give uh, someone uh, any. Anyone wants to chip in before we uh, let Camilla come back in on, on those two questions? Um, 
Ah, Daniel Lazar. Daniel? Here we go. Yourself? Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to take off of the agenderless theme, uh, uh, I, I just think that, that gender can be understood on many levels uh, and that under socialism, under the uh, uh, a democratic socialist uh, uh, society, um, gender would be com- repeatedly redefined on different levels. So it wouldn't be uh, a genderless society, but be a new understanding of gender. Uh, in which child rearing, et cetera, are, are socialized, the responsibility of all society, uh, not just of groups of women. Uh, and that um, uh, mankind will be able to escape uh, this kind of dualism, male-female dualism, without, you know, with the, and not necessarily with, with surrendering, you know, male and female characteristics or, you know, or, or heterosexuality. Uh, but simply um, just redefining uh, gender in different ways and um, uh, as part of the process of, a, of, sh- of a sharing out responsibility uh, for all various social functions. Uh, so that's my, my thought. Thank you. Um, okay, do you want to maybe uh, come back on that unless uh, anyone right. else indicates? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to um, find a f- focus on Jack's main points. I, I agree very strongly with w- most of what uh, what Jack was contributing. Um, yeah, the, the the subject of genders is a is a, a huge one. My my position is on gender that gender is not sex, and it never was. Um, gender is something symbolic, uh, it's performed, it's cons- created, and it doesn't actually map right down to sex. And we can see it when we look at those women doing the menstrual rituals where they are suddenly flipping wrong sex and wrong species, um, particularly the Ngoku. They, they do this incredible, very funny comedy performance of mimicry of men, um, re- really hilarious. And in some ways, gender is that. It's for, we've described it as first gender, wrong sex, that gender is, it frees itself from sex. Nevertheless, it's talking about the relations between the sexes. So when I'm calling this gender egalitarianism, I'm really describing that domain, but I do not make the mistake of saying that gender is the same thing as sex. It's not just sex plus an add-on. Gender plays, gender is a play with the factors of sex. So how do we, so I think that, that you know, what hunter-gatherers or indeed the Greek women in their rituals can show and, and, and also men doing transvestite, there are many, many examples all over the world where genders become multiple genders, um, where people are playing with the facts of sex in, in all kinds of kind of adult games of initiation and spirit and, and uh, at, at the core of religious ritual. Um, so what is a genderless society? You know, when, when we've actually totally shared out equally the costs of reproduction, I'll believe you with genderless, just like classless, you know, class withering away, gender withering away, uh, when there really is a, such an equal distribution of the energy load and the time load and the, we've just watched the lockdown lately and, and the problems coming onto women, either women who are key workers and can't find childcare, or women who are having to do their work at home and can't, and therefore are having to do child schooling as well as work, as well as, uh, um, sure, the men should, should be you know, equally part of that, but is it happening? Is, it, is that happening or not? Um, women need a, a, a way to resist and, and, and make it happen, they, they, they absolutely do. Then I will believe in genderless. Um, the costs of childcare, the re- costs of reproduction, all those heavy, we still have extremely high brain sizes, all those don't go away. Um, Jack is exactly right about the qualities of the diet that hunter-gatherer peoples had compared to farming peoples. And, and I, I completely 
agree. I, I find it mysterious what is David Graeber's motive. We often find ourselves in quite a lot of political agreement in terms of practical action with David. But when it comes to trashing the idea that gender egalitarianism was at the heart of human origins, why he doesn't want to take that on board, we don't understand. We just don't understand. Why is it a good idea to kind of ditch, to kind of fall back on patriarchy theory and talk about women's gender relations amongst farmers, which is what Wengro's specialism, early farming cultures and highlighting. For instance, part of the evidence that um, David Wengro offers in terms of women early farming society having a lot of influence is to look at figurines of female, the, the, the sort of Chutal Hayuk, early Neolithic figurines where there's a lot of imagery of females and a statuary of apparently very powerful looking females. And then they point to some of the very late hunter-gatherer monuments, the famous Gobekli Tepe, which is just over the border actually from Rojava, um, down in South Turkey. And they say, oh, well, look at that. They've got savage animals, um, carnivores, and it's violent. And But when I'm looking at egalitarian hunter-gatherer women doing their rituals, those women are being male and violent in upholding their egalitarianism about, I mean, it's play, it's performance, but that's the message, that's the signal they use. So the idea that imagery of violent, males is not actually part of women's ritual you, you're making an assumption there and the idea that women being portrayed I mean look at the whole history of western art of women being portrayed as you know, they're the center of of attention does that mean women have power I doubt it on this question of refugees which I've seen a few questions there in in the chat We've got to flip it. We've got to understand that in Rojava or amongst those African hunter gatherers, you know, Jack is right. It's kind of get rid of the men. The, the women have their houses, they're, they're like cultural centers. They're like ways where women can create and, and, uh, and find solidarity. They're not, they're, they're not to be thought of in negative terms as refuges. Um, so, women's refuges for amongst African hunter gatherers is where they're doing. Po polyphonic singing is where the, I mean, the whole center of the camp is the women's refuge. Actually, it's men on, who are on the edges who are kind of more, they're, they're in refuge from the mother-in-law fundamentally. Um, so yeah, real old basis for mother-in-law jokes there. Um, and yeah, mother-in-law is the boss in, in, in those contexts. So women's refuges look like a, an entirely different thing. It's women's culture. It, they're, they're just a, so many cultural techniques for the creation of solidarity. So it just is a, a very utterly different thing from what that looks like in, in our society where people are beaten down, people are deprived of resources, people are forced into you know, small spaces and difficult circumstances. Um, that, that, that is really a, a, a different thing. Um, but but yeah, women's space and women's time. We've got to remember, I, I didn't go into the, the issues of the moon, the cosmology, menstruation, all of that. Um, we need to take space, we need to take time. Um, and if women do that with their children, it, men are included. They may be para, they may be, they're included as brothers, they're or included as class comrades. Um, they're not excluded. <laughs> they're not out of that. Um, if they're if if they're part of that process of creation of solidarity and and the collectivization of childcare and and anti privatization, just remove the privatization is something that's uh, very difficult for for our so you know this Puritan individualistic ethic of our society. It's something so difficult to to get our heads around. Um, only, you know, only those who are fighting as class comrades can begin to appreciate what so what a real solidarity will look and feel like. Um, but that has to be women's solidarity at the base of it in terms of childcare, in terms of domestic violence resistance and so forth. 
Okay, um, so we got um, about, uh, what, 13 minutes before I bring uh, you in to sum up. So um, we got roughly, uh, you know, enough for one more round if uh, people keep it uh, short and sweet. Um, so, uh, yeah, if people want to come back for second times. Uh, so I'll bring in uh, Olaf again. Uh, Olaf. You could uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, not that long. Um, so I was one uh, wondering because, um, so this whole this is a theory about how basically cooperation has been driven by it being necessary for the reproductive success of women, more or less. Um, and then it also becomes the reproductive uh, success of every uh, uh, one. So uh, there's uh, that, but this all the focuses on like, conf uh, like you're hiding information from the straight men um, because otherwise they would start a harem basically. Um, and I'm wondering here is, um, does the seemingly high incidence of homosexuality in humans, um, a figure in this theory, uh, like they are not part of this this interaction directly, um, and there I have heard some theories that they are uh, that they appear basically as a sort of cooperative approach, who's uh, because like their only reproductive success can be cooperative. Um, but I'm not sure whether the theory includes them, pr uh, predicts them. Um, I'm just curious about that. Okay. Um, uh, Jack Conrad's indicated again, but um, maybe we could uh, bring in uh, Jerry because uh, he hasn't spoken yet. Uh, Jerry Downing. Okay. Uh, ju ju just a few sh sh few short points. Um, what I think is is that uh, um, the egalitarianism of, of of primitive communism was was based on on a material necessity, and the material necessity was that in order to take from nature what you needed to live, you did need uh, uh, that level of cooperation between the sexes. Uh, in, in, in order to produce. Um, with the development of class society, uh, that, that, that began the, 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 the oppression of women, it began the, 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 the necessary, uh, um, as it was, uh, differentiation be between the sexes. Now, what I, 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 I am enormously impressed by, by Camilla's uh, uh, explanations of, 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 of all the differences. But if you take Rajova and, and, and what's happened in Rajova uh, um, and, and the women's sort of liberation movement that, that has the belt there, it is, it is very beautiful and it's, it's enormously to be... Uh, uh, supported but at the same time it is uh, the product of what i would call an anarcho-stalinist theory and the anarcho-stalinist theory is that you can do that in a separate place at a separate time whilst ignoring the entire global manifestation and therefore you could rely on u.s imperialism to help you to do it and U.S. imperialism is never going to help you to do, to do that. And, and in fact, what Ocalan says is he's, he's two greatest heroes uh, are um, Jerry Adams and Nelson Mandela. Well, Nelson Mandela has produced for us the most unequal society in the whole planet uh, by getting rid of, apart of apartheid South Africa uh, and Jerry Adams hasn't done much better from the north, from, from the north of Ireland. So the global picture is entirely ignored by a localist picture, 
which will not produce universal uh, human liberation in any way what's, what, whatsoever. But but uh, I, I I am I am very impressed by the by, by the details that 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 uh, Camilla has has produced. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Jerry. Um, Jack Conrad uh, for the uh, final speaker, perhaps. We shall see. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think some of the questions are really fascinating. I'm not I'm not going to put myself in a position where I can answer them. I mean, I personally am going to steer a little bit clear of uh, Syria and uh, mm. Nelson and, and uh, Jerry Adams. <laughs> but I was going to make the point really to Jerry that um, I think that, uh, you know, the origin of the family, state, private property, Engels and all that sort of stuff is, is a fantastic book for its time. It really is. It's drawing on the latest stuff. And, uh, you know, Morgan and going back to Greece and stuff that sort of Mike is talking about. But at the same time, I mean, from my memory, who's who's the other comrade that Chris fell out with that we used to have at the Communist University? Lionel Sims. Lionel Sims. He's now, uh, he's now in a late stage of, of lung cancer. It's OK, very, very well, we should send him our, our best. We, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're actually trying to produce a volume of Thestra for him. Yeah. Anyway, Lionel used to come to Communist University. And one of the things he, you know, got into my skull is this sort of idea. That you've got these two theories in Engels. And one of the theories is, Jerry, as you well know, uh, that the reason why we had to cooperate, the reason why we were communists way back in the, the sort of distance past is poverty. Right. So, you know. Uh, life is desperate, therefore we've got to cooperate. And what he banged home into my head is no, 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 it's not me, John, but you know, but no, 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 it was exactly the opposite. And surely that's what we would expect because here we are, we're looking forward to a society of abundance and we can argue what that actually is, but we have a modern theory of abundance and everyone getting enough, not just enough, but yeah. whatever they need to fulfill themselves as a human being and yet we're meant to believe that original communism not primitive i think it's a much better way of saying it original communism came you. into being and we've had that illustrated long by lasting communism or yeah. survival, you, yeah. it's still there comrade. yes exactly living communism, living communism. Came, came into being out of what wasn't communism because she's described this anti-egalitarian alpha male um our ancestors and we then become communists and anyway lionel cut a long story short was saying no 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 that isn't the result of lack of resources with cooperation you have an abundance mm -hmm. of resources and that allows you to relax marshall salans uh, camilla if i'm pronouncing him right describes our primitive or even our contemporaries you know um how many hours a day do they have to work? Yeah, Four yeah. hours. Okay. The rest of the time they're playing with the children. Yeah. You know, that's actually original communism or that's contemporary communism. So we shouldn't have this in our head, this desperate clawing and we have to cooperate because mm. we're so desperate to eat. It's the other way round, right? Yeah. So yeah. I just think that, that that does need well, saying. Actually, in, yeah. Just finally, in terms of this gender thing, which is, again, gets you thinking, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, if we look, I mean, one of the best things, I think I was listening to Stephen Fry. I, I didn't see the TV program, but he goes to some bigger ruler in Africa mm -hmm. and who's banned homosexuality. And Stephen Fry, nice guy, goes, he, the, the, the guy goes, Homosexu homosexuality is unnatural. And Stephen <laughs> Fry's answer was, hey, but it exists in every other species Certainly, every other um, um, what are they some called? Some more than others. Some more than others. Well, I know. Anyway, Camilla, I'll, I'll let you do all this stuff. Yeah. But if you look at bonobos, if you yeah. look at you know bonobos are say violently homosexual, but you know what I mean, right? There's plenty of sex, and there's plenty of sex between the sexes. Yeah. But all I was going to say, I was going to finish on this, if I can, Camilla, that at least in terms of Marxism you do have a duality. You have production and reproduction. And if you take the question of women, 
women in that sense, I know men play a role here, but mm. women play a much bigger role in terms of reproduction, i.e. they carry uh, the child or the fetus for nine months, you know, of necessity, right? Uh, they then have um, an, an extended period because we have big brains and they're growing and our little children don't get up after X amount of time and then run around independently. All I'm, anyway, all I'm saying is that, that because of our big, big brains and the role of culture, um, you know, um, reproduction and production, uh, I think, still have that duality. And I don't think that excludes homosexual relations at all. But anyway, I'd be interested in see what Camilla has to say about that. Hmm. Okay. Um... Just, um, just, just, uh, you know, just uh, get. In I just there. have one other little tiny comment, Camilla. Uh, you, you have egalitarianism or gender egalitarianism made us um, what we are. I just put a note here. What about gender? Because it's an artificial thing. Didn't that also make us egalitarian? That was just a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, you have to forgive my uh, pronunciation, but um, uh, folk de han it's indicated in with a raised hand. Um, yeah, I just pop up, but it's okay. Ah, sorry. Um, uh, my name wasn't designed for English people, so. Um, but I was yeah, wondering. With respect to what uh, you and Jack said about Graeber, right. um, I also found debt really interesting to read. But at the same time, I've been following him. He seems kind of uncomfortable with communism full fledged. I mean, he's he's kind of tried to rehabilitate communistic interactions in debt as one of the modes of interaction between people. Mm -hmm. But there he also he also posits that uh, transactional and hierarchical uh, interactions are just modes of human interaction. Mm -hmm. So he, he doesn't really uh, posit normative. Uh, he doesn't really judge whether one is better than the other. He just presents them as neutral options. So maybe it's because he, well, because he's not really uh, comfortable with communism as a, uh, an organizational form for the entirety of society, mm. that he's also uh, not quite comfortable with talking about uh, the, the stuff that you want him to uh, acknowledge. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just my speculations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to Jack, I was kind of wondering if you could say more about what you said. Um, but maybe that's for tonight because, well, time's almost up. I'll uh, try to be there in the, uh, in the chat if you have time or tomorrow is fine as well, whatever. Thanks. Okay, I think that's uh, just about it. So, Camilla, you want to come in to uh, sum up? Uh, and... Okay, um, I'll try to pick up a few of those points and then and then a general sum up. Um, because uh, Olaf's question about um, is uh, gay or homosexual behaviour connected to this model and its evolution potentially, uh, I would think it's very, very probable that human sexuality became increasingly labile and flexible and, and just opened up a whole space of possibilities. Now, it is true, as Jack says, and Mike has very um, uh, handily put up a reference, Bruce Badge Mill's Biological Exuberance, which covers an array of same-sex behaviors amongst many species. It isn't, I don't know if it's every species, every sexually reproducing species actually, but uh, some more than others. Some really have quite a significant amount of, of, of um, same-sex behaviors as part of it. So they're really homosocial as well as homosexual behaviors. Um, bonobos are just key classic example that that uh, female-female relationships among bonobos are sealed with 
with um, Gigi robbing and, uh, and lesbian behaviors, if you call them that. Um, I, but there is this aspect of kind of gay cultural, that there, there is something that's cultural about human sexuality in ways um, that we may, you know, it, that has a diversity and a, and a possibility that maybe isn't even yet there expressed in, amongst other species. And if we think of the, basically the only rules in the sex strike theory, if we think of Chris's original sex strike theory is that for part of, for the time of the sex strike, heterosexual sex is banned, <laughs> is not to happen, or fertile heterosexual sex is not to happen, but that doesn't say anything about any other form of sex. So it, it just opens up the whole box, Pandora's box of possibles in that. So I think they're increasingly, um, uh, you know, contributions from gay uh, people of either sex would have been very powerful um, in the maintenance of sex strike and in the cultural creativity of sex strike. Um, one of David Graeber's ideas I like very much because it fits to sex strike, he never admits it, but he, but it does, is culture is creative resistance. It, it's kind of, it's born out of resistance is, is what symbolism is born out of. Um, and gay culture would be part and parcel out of that. Um, I was interested in the uh, remarks about uh, Graeber and, and debt and how there is this problem with, with Graeber that he recognizes that we have a kind of communist instinct that we are it, just want to, it's our cooperative eyes, our, all our emotional meshing. We want to cooperate with each other, even with complete strangers. Now, this isn't always perfectly true, but wherever you are in a giant mega, mega city like London today or in a hunter-gatherer camp, we still have this feeling to cooperate with strangers. Um, and where does that come from? Where does great, he, he won't ask the question, how do we have these instincts? They must come from our evolutionary past, David, but, <laughs> but he just doesn't, he trashes evolution. He will not ask those questions. So he, everything has to be cultural without, a, without a, a, some sort of biological root to it. Um, I, I, and I just, I, don't, I, I just can't understand how that can be a scientific attitude. Does David Graeber not believe we descended from great ape ancestors? I don't, I don't understand it. Um, on the issue of Rojava, um, I, I take on the point, Rojava has somewhat displaced class with women's rights issues. And because they are fundamentally kind of peasant economy in that area of the world where there isn't a lot of class differential amongst people there. Um, but the key issues are, are, sex, uh, are sex hierarchy and patriarchy. Then we can understand why that happens and where the women's intense solidarity comes from and how it, it, its success is absolutely extraordinary. If we think about how patriarchal those cultures in that area are and what they have been able to achieve, uh, it needs acknowledgement. Um, but there are inevitably huge problems. Um, I'm, I'm not going to agree completely with everything Jerry says, but there are real problems. But I will make this point. Rojava construes itself as, Rojava is the Kurdish name, but it, it should be emphasized that it is not only Kurdish and nationalist. We, I was meeting Yazidi, Armenian, Assyrian. There was an extraordinary it, international, it, it's not international, it's inter-ethnic communication and cooperation going on when I was able to, to go to Rojava and see that. Um, particularly in areas like developing education systems that, that left um, the old Syrian Arabic hegemonic. Ar Arabs were included in the edu education systems, but they were leaving behind the hegemonic dominance of Arab language and trying to develop systems whereby each community would be learning each other's languages, de develop, understanding each other's cultures and putting that into operation in, in children's schooling. The, the Rojava revolution is con conceived of as transnational and there are aspects of it 
which really could be transnational. That is my interest in trying to link with some of those workers in genealogy. Um, we have, well, what I've been trying to say today is even if we, even if you don't like and accept the theory of the sex strike and the parts of about you know the menstrual um, female cosmetic coalition, there are aspects of our bodies, our eyes, our non-submissive psychologies, our life histories, being grandmothers, being children, aspects of uh, that have happened to us over two million years of evolution that could only have happened if we became increasingly egalitarian, increasingly socially tolerant, able to read and to share our thoughts and our understandings and read each other's minds. None of that could have happened without. Language itself, there was a question that was well interesting that should be asked to Chris next when he talks. Does speech come before egalitarianism? Absolutely no way. Mwajo, this mimicry technique, using laughter to pull somebody down, has no need of speech. It's all acting, it's all laughter, it's, it's pre-verbal. It goes back two million years. That's way before language. Um, so egalitarianism can be built by all kinds of means. Speech is cheap, words are easy, but actions of you know, using your bodies with other people, of singing together, that, that takes cost, it takes energy, it takes emotion, it takes you know, investment. Those things create egalitarianism. Um, so we, we have a, a long history um, and our bodies show it and our minds show it of, of, interact, of, of egalitarianism, social interaction. And it's like the, 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 the symbolism, the language, the, um, all the sex strike stuff comes as a kind of cherry on top of that cake. Yeah, we, we've been building up to it for a long, long, long period. Even if you don't believe the sex strike stuff, you've got to believe the evidence of our bodies in terms of the construction of egalitarianism as the basis for human evolution. There were other hominin populations that didn't get the egalitarianism and they're not here today. And maybe Neanderthals had a little bit less, they may have had a bit more male domination, they may have had some male kin bonding as against female kin bonding, possibly. That could have been something that just pulled it back um, no matter how much they were cooperative with us, uh, they, they were not a large population. Women were not producing very many children for reasons that in their environments would have been very, very difficult um, comparative to the African populations that we came, came out of. Um, so basically we're here because they had smaller populations, um, but there may have been some other reasons to do with the politics that, that they're not here and we are. I mean, they are, they are in some sense, in some genetic sense. Um, what, what else can we say here? Um, yeah, Steve, the, the idea that warfare goes back, that there, there are still theories out there that are basically coming from pretty pa institutionally patriarchal anthropologists, people like Richard Wrangham, that warfare, even, even people like Michael Tomasello get dragged into this argument. Warfare was required to create co collective, um, you know, solidarity against the enemy, and that that was the basis on which we developed norms, rules, symbolism, language itself. We needed warfare to, to do that. Um, we needed some form of warfare, but it wasn't gonna be warfare between groups that were you know, throwing spears and bows and arrows and bows and arrows at each other. It was a, a kind of playful warfare going on between the sexes. Um, and to answer this question of does gender itself create egalitarianism, I agree with that entirely because gender is like an original symbolic construct. When the sexes, both the sexes, male and female, and there is some a level of in-between sex, some, some of the population, but male and female are fundamentally the, the reproductive polarity for sexy reproducing species. Gender is a kind of playful warfare going on between those sexes. And, and that is where our symbolic culture begins with, with that game, with that game of gender relations. And you really can only play games and enjoy games with your equals. You can't play games with people who are massively bigger and stronger than you are and are gonna you know, chuck you down. You just can't. Okay, I think we can finish up with that. 
Okay, right. Thanks. That was a, um, a, a very diverse um, set of uh, ideas. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, I, I think the uh, radical anthropology stuff is always uh, quite interesting uh, and uh, it's certainly um, no different this time. Um, okay, so uh, Emil has just um, put in chat the uh, link for the Discord if you uh, wish to uh, join our uh, social tonight. Um, I certainly know I need a beer. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so uh, I think that's uh, everything I have for um, messages. Um, I'll just keep it open so people can click the Discord link if they want. And uh, I think that's it. Lovely. Night, night, everyone. Thank you for the great questions. It's always great to have your questions. Thank you for the great talk. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. <laughs>